Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. Before we begin, please be aware, we have a tendency to swear. You have been warned, make no mistake, so join us now. We're We're For Fox Fox Sake. Sake. Welcome to For Fox Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm your host, Ellen, and this week, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Carly and Abigail. Hello, friends. I'm happy to be back. Hey, everyone. Max got stuck at work today longer than expected, so he's not able to join us this time, and we're going to miss him. But he will be back. Speaking of back, flashback. Phoenix flashback. Let's fly into the Phoenix flashback. Last week, we covered the second half of Chapter 19, Elf Tales, and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. Harry visits Ron before the Quidditch match against Hufflepuff and is nearly late to said match when he's met with an opportunity to meddle with Malfoy on his way to the pitch. Luna gives the most disastrous and delightful Luna commentary that ever could have been commentated, but Cormac's disastrous and douchey attempt to be team captain takes the match on a disastrous, disappointing, and dangerous turn landing Harry in the hospital wing with a cracked skull and a loss on his captain record. Being in the hospital with yet another Quidditch injury gives Harry the idea to call for Creature so he can set him to meddle with Malfoy. This brings an elf fight to the hospital wing as Dobby is defending Harry's honor against Creature's insults. Harry and Ron break up the fight, but not before Creature is down some teeth because Dobby don't let no one mess with Harry Potter. Harry then orders Creature to tail Draco, closing all the loopholes possible to prevent the elf from tipping him off, and Dobby also volunteers to help. Unless you're watching the movie, in which case, absolutely nothing remotely close to this happened. During episode 231, Niffler for Knowledge, our Potter pondering was... What are your thoughts on the movie leaving out Harry, setting Creature, and Dobby to tell Malfoy? Hi, this is Jessica calling in my Potter pondering. I think that they really missed Harry's urgency to find out what Draco's doing by not having Creature and Dobby in this movie following around Draco. It just adds so much to Harry's obsession with Draco and everything that's going on there and the change that they made in the movie of giving the audience so much more detail into what Draco's been up to than Harry finds out in the book for a long time you know and I don't know why that they have to leave out Creature and leave out Dobie like we haven't seen Dobie now since the second movie why do they hate Dobie why do they hate him? Why do they hate Dobby? I just... I think it was an oversight on their part. I really do. I just... I don't know why they had to change so much for this movie. They're... They're crazy. G'day guys, it's Jackson here, coming at you with my pot of pondering from my new house. What do I think of the movie leaving out Harry using Creature and Dobby to tell Malfoy? Did not like that one bit. The one thing, I wanted to see more of Dobby and more of Creature than we got. And two, it made a lot more sense than the reveal that we got in the movie where we just basically knew what Malfoy was up to already. I mean, what? What is this crap? Why didn't we get more of Dobby and Creature? And why did the movie just reveal stuff like that? Hated it. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, what does Luna say a Gertie root is good for warding off? Luna claims they are excellent for warding off gulping plimpies. Congratulations goes to Jessica Wallace. Hooray! She's at nine weeks in a row, just one away from double digits and four away from beating that record. Can she keep this going? You never know. For now, let's dive into the first half of Chapter 20, Lord Voldemort's Request, and that's it. 
because there's no corresponding film scenes. Chapter 20, Lord Voldemort's Request, Part 1. Harry and Ron both get to leave the hospital wing the following Monday morning and are now able to enjoy the benefits of having been knocked out and poisoned, the best of which is Hermione and Ron being friends again. She walks them down to breakfast, bringing the news that Ginny and Dean had an argument. The creature in Harry's chest raises its head, and he attempts to casually ask what the fight was about. They turn onto a seventh floor corridor, where a very small girl looks terrified at the sight of them and drops her heavy brass scales. Hermione hurries forward and repairs them for her, but the little girl does not thank her, merely standing in place as she watches them walk out of sight. Ron makes a comment about them getting smaller, and Harry steers the conversation back to Ginny and Dean's row. She explains that Dean was laughing about McLagan hitting him with the bludger. Ron reasonably says it must have looked funny, but Hermione insists that it was terrible, and if Coot and Peaks hadn't caught Harry, he could have been very badly hurt. Still trying to sound casual, Harry says that there wasn't any need for Ginny and Dean to split up over it, then asks if they're still together. Hermione says they are, but also wants to know why Harry is so interested. He insists that he just doesn't want his Quidditch team messed up again, but she still looks suspicious, so he's very relieved when a distraction shows up in the form of Luna. She rummages in her bag as she tells him that she went to the hospital wing to find him, but he'd already left. She then shoves something that appears to be a green onion, a large spotted toadstool, and a considerable amount of what looks like cat litter into Ron's hands before pulling out a scroll of parchment and handing it to Harry. It's from Dumbledore, setting another lesson for that night. Ron tells Luna that he enjoyed her commentary, and then asks about the onion-like object. She calls it a Gertie root and says he can keep it since she has a few of them, declaring them to be excellent for warding off gulping plimpies. She then walks away, leaving Ron chuckling, still clutching the Gertie root. He begins to comment on how she's grown on him, being insane, but in a good way. But he's interrupted when he sees an angry lavender standing at the foot of the marble staircase. He nervously says hi, and Harry mutters to Hermione to come on. As they speed past, they can hear Lavender ask why he didn't tell her he was getting out, and why she was with him. When he appears at breakfast a half hour later, he sits with Lavender, but appears sulky and annoyed. Harry doesn't see them exchange a single word the entire time, but does notice that though Hermione is pretending to be oblivious to the whole thing, she smirks a couple of times. The whole day she seems to be in a particularly good mood, and even agrees to look over Harry's herbology essay, which she had previously been refusing to do so, so Ron couldn't copy it too. Harry thanks her, and then heads to his lesson with Dumbledore. He knocks on the door right at eight, and when Dumbledore tells him to enter, he opens the door to find Professor Trelawney in the office as well. She dramatically points at Harry and asks if this is why she is being unceremoniously thrown from the office. Dumbledore sounds a little exasperated as he says he isn't unceremoniously throwing her from anywhere, but Harry does have an appointment and there really isn't more to be said. Trelawney responds that if he will not banish the usurping nag, perhaps she will find a school where her talents are better appreciated. She pushes past Harry and heads out of sight, down the spiral staircase, where they hear her stumble. Dumbledore tiredly asks Harry to close the door and sit down, and Harry obeys, noticing the pensive is again between them, along with two more tiny crystal bottles of swirling memories. Harry asks about Professor Trelawney still being unhappy that Ferenz is still teaching, and Dumbledore confirms this, saying divination is turning out to be more trouble than he could have foreseen, not having studied the subject himself. He can't ask Ferenz to return to the forest, nor can he ask Sybil Trelawney to leave, 
confessing to Harry that she has no idea the danger she would be in outside the castle, as she doesn't know she made the prophecy about him and Voldemort. He sighs and tells Harry to never mind his staffing issues. They have much more important matters to discuss. He inquires if Harry has managed the task he set for him at the end of their previous lesson, and because of apparition lessons, Ron being poisoned, getting his skull cracked, and his determination to figure out what Malfoy is up to, Harry has to admit that he asked him about it at the end of class, but Professor Slughorn wouldn't give it to him. After a moment of silence, Dumbledore asks if Harry feels he has exerted his very best efforts in the matter, exercised all of his considerable ingenuity, and has no depth of cunning left to retrieve the memory. Harry stalls, unsure of what to say next, realizing his one attempt to get the memory was embarrassingly feeble. He mentions hoping to get Slughorn in a good enough mood, the day Ron swallowed the love potion, but then Ron ended up poisoned and he forgot. Dumbledore is understanding of this, but says that he would have thought he would have returned to the task once he knew his best friend was going to make a full recovery. He thought he made it very clear how important the memory is, being the most crucial memory of all. Harry feels ashamed and would prefer Dumbledore to yell at him over this cold disappointment. He desperately tries to defend himself, saying it wasn't that he wasn't bothered. He starts to say he just had other things on his mind, and Dumbledore cuts him off to finish the sentence for him. When he says he sees, silence falls between them again until Harry can't stand it anymore and apologizes. He tells his headmaster that he should have done more. He should have realized he wouldn't have asked him to do it if it wasn't really important. Dumbledore accepts this and says he hopes Harry will give the matter higher priority from now on. Harry earnestly says he'll get it from him, and Dumbledore kindly changes the subject to continue their story where they left off. He asks if Harry remembers, and Harry responds with a brief summary of Voldemort killing his grandparents and framing his uncle for it. He stutters a little in shame when he gets to the part where he mentions Voldemort gets back to Hogwarts and asks Professor Slughorn about Horcruxes, but Dumbledore just says, very good, and mentions how they are entering the realms of guesswork and speculation. He hopes Harry agrees that thus far he has shown him reasonably firm sources of fact for his deductions leading up to Voldemort at age 17. Harry nods, and then Dumbledore explains that things become murkier and stranger, as it is almost impossible to find anyone prepared to reminisce about adult Voldemort. He does have two more memories to share, and then he would like Harry's opinion as to whether the conclusions he has drawn are correct. The idea that Dumbledore values Harry's opinion makes him feel even more ashamed about the Horcrux memory task, and he shifts guiltily in his seat. Dumbledore raises the first of the two memories and informs Harry that it came from a very old house elf by the name of Hokey. But he must first recount how Lord Voldemort left Hogwarts. He reached his seventh year with top marks in every examination, and nearly everyone expected great things from Tom Riddle, prefect, head boy, winner of the award for special services to the school. Professor Slughorn and other teachers suggested he join the Ministry of Magic and offered to set up appointments, but he refused them all and ended up working at Borgen and Burks. This information also stuns Harry, but Dumbledore is sure he will understand what attracted him to the place after entering Hokie's memory. What most people don't know is that it wasn't his first choice for jobs. He actually first approached Professor Dippet and asked to remain at Hogwarts as a teacher. Harry is even more amazed and asks why he wanted to stay there. Dumbledore explains that though he didn't confide any of them to Professor Dippet, he thinks he had several reasons to want to stay. For one, it was the only place that felt like home and was where he had been happiest. This makes Harry a little uncomfortable since he feels the same way. Dumbledore also says that he likely felt there were still more mysteries to unravel and that as a teacher, he would have had great power and influence over young witches and wizards and saw it as a useful recruiting ground. Harry comments about him not getting the job, and Dumbledore explains that Professor Dippet felt he was too young and invited him to reapply in a few years if he still wished to teach. 
Harry wonders how Dumbledore felt about that, and the headmaster replies that he was deeply uneasy. He had advised Armando against the appointment, though he did not give him the same reasons he just told Harry, because Professor Dippet was very fond of Voldemort and convinced of his honesty. However, he did not want Lord Voldemort back at the school, and especially not in a position of power. Harry asks what subject he wanted to teach, but also thinks he knows the answer before being given it. Defense Against the Dark Arts, which was being taught by an old professor named Galatea Marithot. Dumbledore brings the conversation back around to Voldemort going off to Borgen and Burks, which the school staff thought was a waste of a brilliant young wizard. But Voldemort was no mere assistant. Being polite, handsome, and clever, he was particularly good at persuading people to part with their magical treasures. This doesn't surprise Harry, and Dumbledore agrees before saying it is time to hear from Hokey, the house elf, who worked for a very old, very rich witch named Hepzibah Smith. He magically uncorks the bottle and tips the memory into the pensive before telling Harry to go first. Harry stands and bends over the contents, again tumbling through darkness. This time, he lands in a sitting room in front of a very fat old lady in an elaborate ginger wig and a brilliant pink set of robes that flows around her and makes her look like a melting cake. She is looking in a jeweled mirror to put on rouge while the tiniest house elf Harry has ever seen laces her feet into satin slippers. Hepzibah tells Hokey to hurry up since he'll be there at four. It is only a couple minutes too, and he's never been late. She then tucks away her powder puff and asks the little elf how she looks. As the elf squeaks that her mistress looks lovely, Harry figures it must be in Hokey's contract to lie when asked this question because he thought Hepzibah Smith was a long way from lovely. The doorbell rings and Hepzibah cries that he is there and sends Hokey scurrying through the cluttered room to fetch him. It is so crammed with objects and plants that it looks like a cross between a magical antique shop and a conservatory. But Hokey returns within minutes leading a tall young man. Harry immediately recognizes him as Voldemort. He is dressed in a black suit with his hair a little longer and his cheeks a little hollower, but looking more handsome than ever. He makes his way through the room in a way that suggests he has many times and bows over Hepzibah's hand, giving it a kiss. He tells her he brought her flowers and makes a bunch of roses appear from nowhere. Though Hepzibah squeals that he shouldn't have, Harry notices an empty vase standing ready on the nearest little table. She then invites Tom to sit down and asks where Hokey has gone. The little elf dashes back into the room with a tray of little cakes, and Hepzibah tells Tom to help himself. She also asks how he is, saying he looks pale and that they overwork him at the shop. When Voldemort gives her a mechanical smile, she simpers and asks what his excuse to visit is this time. Voldemort begins to tell her Mr. Burke's improved offer for the goblin made armor at 500 galleons. But she cuts him off to pout not to go too fast or she'll think he's only there for her trinkets. Voldemort quietly responds that he's ordered there because of them, saying he's only a poor assistant who must do as he is told. He begins to again mention what Mr. Burke wishes, but Hepzibah waves her hand to stop him and tell him she has something to show him that she has never shown Mr. Burke. She asks Tom if he can keep a secret, as she doesn't want Mr. Burke to know she has it because she will never sell it to anyone, but she is sure he will appreciate it for its history. Voldemort says he will be glad to see anything Miss Hepzibah has to show him, and she gives another girlish giggle before ordering Hokey to bring their finest two treasures. And if you're watching the movie, absolutely none of this happened because they don't care to involve anything after Voldemort's 16 and asks about Horcruxes. Yeah, and I feel like it really does a disservice because... This is a good world-building scene, one, and character-building scene, two. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And also, he just, what, these horcruxes just appear out of nowhere? The two that he gets from Hepzibah, yeah, it's like they do appear out of nowhere. Like, where did he find... Why? Uh, yeah, words. So many words. I know, right? That's just what it is. I can tell you as a person who watched the movies first and then read the books, when I started getting into areas like this in the books, I'm like, oh my gosh, Voldemort and the Horcruxes so and all sense. this stuff makes so much more sense now. Yeah. I saw this movie in theaters with 
two different people, actually, one who has read the books and one who had not. And obviously, if you've read the books, you know what's going on and you're just sitting there like, why'd they leave this out? Why'd they leave this out? Why'd they leave this out? And if you haven't read the books, it was so much of what what's are Horcruxes? Why did this? Ha- what is this supposed to be? I don't understand. Yeah. And it's not that much to include this. Like, it's kind of a longer thing to read, but they could have included a lot of this probably in minutes. I do think that a lot of the background knowledge on Voldemort could have been included more like a montage scene even like if you don't want to take the full time and hit on each individual one like some of the times that they're going into the pensieve it just be like a briefest glimpse of this is what happened this is what happened this is what happened so but they don't do it that way give us a little montage of the memories they didn't hire me to be their script advisor (laughs) Maybe for the TV show. Maybe for the TV show. Hey, HBO, are you listening? Yo. I believe they're Max now. Yes, they Whatever. are. Whatever. <laughs> You're still HBO. And, like, some of this stuff, you really can sum it up pretty quickly. Like, reading it mm-hmm. and getting the details did take a little bit longer to have this long of an episode of what this will end up being without any movie summaries at all. I mean, that just speaks to how much we can talk about this. But if you really wanted to just give the taste of it in the movie to include it, like having that little bit of moment, because that's kind of where it starts off is Harry and Ron leaving the hospital wing, which Mm -hmm. we didn't even get to see that happen from the Harry side. Mm -mm. Like he didn't end up in the hospital. We didn't get to see him get hit in the skull. That also would have been really nice to see because Cormac being a turd would be fun to see it would be so fun to see all of this would have been fun to see from Mm -hmm. like I mean let's we all want to see everything we all want it to be included like but in specific like you were saying the world building and the character building but like Ron and Harry getting that moment in the hospital wing together and that kind of seriousness of that situation even though it's also kind of humorous is genuinely what really brought Ron and Hermione back, back together. together yeah. And that's what they even say at the start of this chapter is like, that's the best part of them both ending up in the hospital wing. One of the benefits is Hermione's just like, all right, back to norms. <laughs> True. Mm-hmm. True. And she shows up when they're allowed to leave the hospital wing and walks in a breakfast. And she comes with this news that Ginny and Dean had a fight. And Harry and that little monster that's been living within him is just like, oh, oh did they split up? <laughs> he's such a <laughs> he's a mess. And he tries to very, very casually source this information from Hermione. She gets knows. A little bit interrupted by the first thing, it actually gets this goes on long enough that it has two interruptions. The first interruption is they're walking along a seventh floor corridor, which, if you're paying attention, should sound familiar. And there's this random little girl standing in the corridor holding a set of brass scales. And when she sees them, she panics and drops it and they shatter to the ground and make a really loud noise. And Hermione just immediately rushes over to her and repairs them for her. And is like, oh, it's okay. And the girl just weirdly stands there and does nothing. Doesn't say anything. Doesn't thank her. Nope, just just takes petrified. the scales back and stands there looking petrified. Right, Abigail? She's me in Hogwarts Legacy. <laughs> I'm just standing there loading. I'm looking at my loading screen. Yeah. <laughs> and... Ron's just like, that was weird. Like, they seem to be getting smaller. And Harry's just like, I don't really care. So anyway, Ginny and Dean. Mm -hmm. And they keep on walking. And the girl just stands there watching them walk away while they just keep on walking. Once they're out of sight, she just goes back to whatever she's doing. And they get back on the topic of Ginny and Dean's row. I would argue with Dean about this, too. Yeah, that's what Hermione says that... Dean was laughing at the thought of Harry getting hit with the Pletcher by McLagan. 
And Ron is trying to be very reasonable about this. I'm sure he wishes he had gotten to witness it as well, because he's like, I'm sure it probably did look funny. And Hermione's like, no! It he was scary. Been, yeah, he could have been like, seriously hurt or even killed. I love the fact that she says that, though. She literally does say if Kooten Peaks had not have caught Harry, he could have been very badly hurt. So we're not counting a cracked skull as being very badly hurt, apparently. But that always got me, too. It's just funny the way it was worded. He could have been very badly hurt. Lucky it was just a cracked skull. Right. I guess maybe they think that because... They can throw bones back and mend them very easily. Madame Pomfrey just be like, and then it's healed. No more cracked skull. I mean, his brain probably might have swollen. Right, you still have to stay in the infirmary overnight, Harry, because we've got to watch that concussion. (laughs) Yeah, and I mean, he's not a Ravenclaw, so he's probably got some extra space in his head for the swelling. (laughs) Extra gray matter, just in case. But I love the fact here that Harry is just thinking he's being so cashy-cash and is like, yeah, but, I mean, there was no need for them to break up over it, or are they still together? And Hermione, at this point, is like, yeah, they're still together. Why are you so interested? And I think that's very interesting, because in the movie, she's flat out called Harry out for how he looks at Jenny, even though they've barely given us moments of him looking at Jenny. Right. So in the movie, Hermione knows very well that Harry is all about Ginny. Yeah. And is hurting that he can't be with Ginny and is struggling to see Ginny and Dean. But Hermione in the book is just kind of being like, why are you so interested? Like, this is when she starts to really figure it out. I think she knew before. I think she's playing coy. Trying to get Harry to admit it? To get Harry to admit it. Yeah, that's kind of what I I think. I think you're right. It's just funny because it's very different from how the movie did it. I appreciate the friend aspect that they put in the movie. Yeah. That she notices that and she's like, I see how you look at her. Yeah, I I don't mind that change at all. No. But it is just very interesting. I think they do better with Hermione and Harry's relationship in the movie than they do in the book, if I'm being true. Harry and Hermione. Hermione? Oh, yeah, their friendship, how they build it how they have those moments of just connection together they don't do that in the books there's not i think it's funny that my brain heard harry and Ginny. yeah (laughs) and i was just like who i'm sorry what do (laughs) what we're about to fight yeah Yeah, i was gonna say in the movie i was just very confused when it turned out they liked each other i was like when did this happen i didn't see any of that lead up even when they had like the weird like let me feed you this thing that just felt like a girl with a big crush doing something awkward i did not at first pick up the fact that harry was like oh, this is Into awkward her. for me too because I kind of like you. Yeah. yeah. And it's really fun that this just came up just now because now I can plug Jackson's episode that's going to be upcoming. Nice. We're going to be recording a Potterheads of History. We're trying to get back on track with those. And the topic that Jackson, one of our patrons, wanted to cover was book Harry and Ginny's relationship. So Specifically if you book. want to be more in on that discussion and you aren't already a patron, you should definitely look into our Patreon and come join us for that. But like I said, Hermione is very much like, why are you so interested in this, Harry? Instead (laughs) of being like, yeah, I see it. Even though I think you're right, Carly, and I think that is what she's doing. She's just like, oh, I totally know what you're doing, but I'm going to tease you about it and see if I can get you to admit it. But Harry's just like, oh, I just don't want my Quidditch team to get messed up. Nope, that's that's totally what this is. Quidditch. It's all it's all Quidditch. Like we already we already lost Katie Bell, and and then I had to bring Dean on. And if Dean and Ginny start fighting and break up, then they're not going to play well together, and that's just a problem for Quidditch. Yep. I mean, in his defense, that is something stupid that he would say. Is definitively like, oh, I just don't want my team messed up. Like that fits the personality. So it does, but it also is not the it's reason not true. he's interested. It's not true. Lucky for him, the second distraction from this conversation shows up at this moment in the form of Luna. Love it. We did not get enough of distractions in the form of Luna. Max and I already talked a lot about how upset we were. We did not get that commentary. 
Yeah, that's so disappointing that that wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Like, they love giving Luna wacky things to say. Ivana Lynch giving her the amazing Luna moments, and they didn't think that they couldn't have a few minutes of this. No. It's just like, what, like this Ew, was David. amazing. Ew, David, indeed. By the way, while I was at the studio tour, I took a video of me shaking my fist at the poster of Mike Newell, so I have to get around to posting those pictures eventually. It's my favorite. Okay. <laughs> Newell. But, ew, David, indeed. So Luna shows up because this is the next person that Dumbledore has sent with a note to Harry for his next private lesson meeting time. And despite the fact that I imagine he just gave this to her, she tucks it in her bag to walk to the hospital wing, does not find Harry in the hospital wing because he's been released, and then has to pull everything but the kitchen sink out of her bag to find the note for Harry. Like, you don't just put it in your pocket. No, this is the most Ravenclaw girl thing ever. Oh my ever. god, and it's just the Goes most in my bag Luna with all my thing. shit. I love the it. She literally. Movies? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Well, at least the ones they sell it. Universal. Well, they talk about keeping their wands in their robe pockets mm -hmm. and stuff too. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, definitely need a robe. But cloaks, man. She cloaks. pulls out a green onion, or at least it's something that looks kind of like a green onion. A large spotted toadstool. She's been foraging. A considerable amount of what looks like cat litter <laughs> and a partridge in a pear tree. Like I don't understand why these things are in her bag other than the fact that it's luna yeah i would have loved them to She's ask been her foraging. about them like what i know are these things why do you need them because i really want to know what the cat litter type product is She's probably going to put it like in the nasal's pen or something, something yeah. yeah and she literally just puts it all in ron's hands yeah and he Same. only asked are you standing next to me take hold this yeah. hold this hold this and i would have died to see Ivana Lynch piling all of this random shit in Rupert Grint's hands. Can you just imagine what that scene would have looked like? It would have been gold yes. because his facial expressions. I uh -huh. know. And she does such a great job staying in character. Just keeping the straightest of straight dreamy faces on. Yep. That's just her. It's so perfect. It's so funny. I like, I can picture it so well. It's almost like it did happen. But this is also one of those things where my brain hasn't gotten confused and I know it didn't happen. So I just feel this deep depression about <clears throat> it. Real. <laughs> and like you said, Abigail. Yeah, just the one item. Just He hey. just asks about the one item. He's not curious about the cat litter. He's not curious about the toadstool but what's this onion like object apparently it is a gertie root and she says he can keep it because she's got multiples and they're really good for warding off gulping plimpies which was our trivia question and i don't know what a gulping plimpy is i thought it said gulping pimples it's plimpies. for about five minutes yeah. but it is plimpies it is plimpies it is plimpies and I don't know if that's one of those things that Luna believes in. Probably. Or if this is an actual magical thing. Yeah, I don't know either. Because honestly, it could easily go either way. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the scarier thing is he only asks about the one thing, which means he, knowing Ron Weasley in the book and how in, in tune and intelligent he is about the wizarding world, that means he's looking at the other things in his hands and going, I know what that cat litter is for. I have to know what that toadstool is for. But what's this other thing? That's a good point. In Hogwarts Legacy, when you walk around, you pick up spotted toadstools a lot. That's true. They are so an ingredient for potions. They are an stuff. ingredient for potions. So I feel like Luna is just out and being like, oh, look at this stuff. Let me pick it up. Take it. It's entirely possible. Cat litter. I don't know. It looks like cat litter. Right. Yes. It, it does say it looks cat like cat litter. litter. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's fairy dust. Whatever it is, Ron knows what it is because he doesn't ask about it. He doesn't ask about it. They don't cover I, fairies enough in this series, truthfully. No, they really don't. We could have had more. There's this whole area of the wizarding, like Harry Potter wizarding world to explore, and the author has just killed any opportunity for continuing that expansion. I really hope because she, yes, owns the rights to the books and plays, but she does not own the rights to 
the movies and the video games. So I really hope going forward we get new great stuff through games and the TV show and maybe future movies or something. I wish the Fantastic B series hadn't been cursed because that would oh have given us a God, lot of so information. Cursed. I, like, I so loved much them we're learn so there. much. <sighs> Granted, 99% of that is because of Eddie Redmayne. And then it was like... I love the Hufflepuff pride they put into every too, single yes. movie. Okay, maybe me saying 99% is too high because, God, I also loved Yumbledore. Yeah, Yumbledore was good. And I loved Queenie. And oh my you loved God, Queenie. I loved Queenie's Jacob. Perfect. And I loved Tina. And I loved Tina. And no, it's, relationship. A great, it's a great cast of characters. Yes. And I loved all of the creatures. And that actually lines up with where we are for two reasons. One, because Luna ends up marrying Newt Scamander's grandson. And <gasps> two, there is heavy speculation that Jacob is a wizard and he is related to Hepzibah Smith because his last name is Smith. No, Kowalski, and Kowalski is a Polish version of Smith. So there's a whole big scooby doo about that. We should just, we should, what we should do is start a petition to get them to finish the series. What's really <laughs> weird to me is I remember from the beginning her saying she had five movies planned. And then after the third one, David Yates came forward and said something about how that there being five was news to him and he never thought so like it's so it ended on obvious a, on a that weird that was not note an end. Yeah. like you can't build up the whole backstory between it was supposed to end with the fight right i know that a lot of people didn't like them because they weren't what they wanted them to be they were exactly what i wanted them but to they be. were <laughs> Honestly, I liked them better than the Harry Potter movies. And I think some of that has to do with... They got to build the world. Yeah. And they got to show us the world. And there wasn't stuff for them to leave out because the stuff that was there was already... It was written. It was in the script. It was, like, literally there. So all the stuff they gave us was fresh, new, exciting yep. stuff while, with this nostalgic backer. Yeah. And it was good. And the characters were great. And... And what I think we connect to these characters more now because these characters are our age. There's that. That's fair. Yeah. Yep. We are <laughs> old. Not you're not as old as we are, but <laughs> we Still, are definitely yeah. above student aged. I yeah, spent two watching... days on the couch with my back hurting. I am old. Oh, Carly is officially in the old club. <laughs> I was yeah. like, welcome to your thirties. Because thirty yeah. was just twenty nine ten. Yeah. You're like twenty ten when you're thirty. Yeah. But now you're thirty one. Yeah. So you're like literally in your thirties. That's what I said. I'm like, noticing more aches and pains. Yep. Yes. Yep. But, but yeah, it's just it like Newt Scamander, one of the reasons he's so attractive, besides the fact that he's played by Eddie Redmayne, <laughs> is you look at him and you're like, that's a peer. Yes. <sighs> but we got way off topic. Uh, that being a fantastic discussion. We're going to leave it in Newt there anyway. Newt Scamander's granddaughter-in-law. Yeah. Let's get let's back, back to, to her. our connection here with his granddaughter-in-law. Or at least her exit at this point, because yeah. she leaves Ron with this Gertie route and it. just like walks off and she takes the other stuff back. But she just like, I just, I don't know, like, is he just holding a pile of cat litter? Is there like cat litter now all over the floor? She's trying to get it back in her bag or is it like a bag of something that looks like cat no, litter? he's holding just stray cat litter and then know, he dumps like, it back into her bag. I wanted awkwardly. to see this scene. And then she leaves and Ron's chuckling. He's just like, you know, she's really growing on me. I, I know she's insane, but it's a good kind of insane. Shut up, Ron. <laughs> I was just like, oh, and, Ron. <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of insulting because he's still Ron who says things that are funny sometimes, but can also be kind of cruel. But at the same time, he is starting to understand what a good person she is. And that she is a good friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interruption number three. And not a good friend. <laughs> and not a good friend. <laughs> not a good girlfriend Comes either. in the form of <laughs> Lavender, who is irate. Now, granted, I cannot blame her for this. Because not only does her boyfriend pretend to be asleep. She may not know he's pretending. but I'm dying. 
Her boyfriend pretended to be asleep every single time she went to go visit him in the hospital wing. He then didn't tell her that he was getting let out. (laughs) I do fault her for this, honestly, because she never took time to build their relationship. All she wanted to do was snog him. Well, I don't mean that I don't blame her for that aspect of the relationship. I mean, I don't blame her for being upset. Yeah, I mean, you're making your own bed, laying it. <laughs> She's 16. She is 16. I guess I would probably only want... I didn't have a boyfriend when I was 16, but I assumed that I probably would only have wanted to make out with him. Probably. I had a boy, my first boyfriend at 17, and I feel like we did make out a lot. Yeah, the <laughs> boyfriend I had in high school. The only boyfriend I had in high school. We made out a lot. Okay. Don't be mad, though. <laughs> get glad <laughs> but yeah so she's pissed because he didn't tell her that he was getting out of the hospital wing same and harry and hermione are just like we are not going to stick around for this let's get out of here Hurry, run! <laughs> and as they're running from the situation harry can hear lavender go why didn't you tell me you were getting out and why was she with you i don't like this I hate this a whole bunch. Yeah. They were- My husband has friends who are females, who are women, and I don't mind. Nope. Right. Granted, I'm older than Lavender. Just a little bit. But I think even when I was 16, if I had... He and her were friends far before you came into the picture. Stop being a jerk. Right. That's okay. what I was about to say. Like, she was there first. Yes. Yeah. Also, I think And she's... maybe Lavender sees it. I'm sure Lavender absolutely knows there is something going on between Ron and Hermione, and she swooped in before it could become a real thing. Yeah, she's been And she's has legitimately... so much insecurity because she knows. She's legitimately insecure. She's <laughs> Yeah, she's just super insecure. Legitimately, we don't know if Lavender's alive or not because the author will not tell us whether she's alive or not because all we see is her getting her face eaten by Greyback at one point. But the last we heard was that she was feebly stirring. But I hope in her old age that she is grown and has found somebody who loves her and is dedicated to her because Lavender, baby, you deserve it. Yeah, because as obnoxious as she could be in some of these moments... It is really tough being 16 years old and dealing with your first boyfriend and realizing that he's just not that into yeah. you. And Okay, let's be honest. Full-grown adult women still have a hard time with that true. sometimes. It's oh, true. Definitely. <laughs> so I... Because of the insecurities instilled in us yeah, when we were that 16. That she was 16 and lacks the emotional maturity you would expect an adult woman to have just makes me mm-hmm. feel that much more empathy for her. Yeah. <laughs> And this, I do, I do feel bad for her for this. Like, I understand why she's upset. The age that I am now and the emotional maturity that I'm at now can usually just be like, all right, well, he's not that into me, so time to move on. I'm not putting up with this bullshit. But when you're 16, you're like, how do I make him like me more? Yeah, I get it. Yep. Poor Lav Lav. Poor Lav Lav. Poor laugh, laugh. And then Ron's not helping the situation at all because he's being such a coward about actually ending it that they have this argument and then he still proceeds to sit with her at breakfast even though they don't even talk to one another the entire time. I think that I appreciate you see a lot of Ron's growth, though. Like, he doesn't want to hurt her feelings. Some some situations when Ron was younger, he would just been like, I don't have time for you, go away. But in this situation, you see how much he's grown as a person. And he, like, doesn't want to hurt her feelings because... Yeah, I'm not entirely sure I see that as growth because it's also avoidance. It is also (laughs) avoidance. But I think not wanting to hurt her feelings is the growth that I'm specifically I do think that he doesn't want to hurt her feelings. It's not like she's done anything wrong. I think he doesn't want to hurt her feelings because he's terrified of the reaction. And even though he's he's their girlfriend, they're both Gryffindors and he is terrified of her. There's no courage when it comes to laugh, laugh. (laughs) Yeah. And I get that. (laughs) This is a definite on Gryffindor moment for Ron. Yeah. Yeah. Harry specifically makes note and you know, if Harry's noticing it, it's gotta be obvious. (laughs) He specifically makes note of the fact that they don't speak to each other. And he also notices that Hermione 
is pretending she doesn't notice this, but also kind of keeps smirking about it. I love her. And she's just like, oh, yeah, I won. Now it's just me biding my time. Somehow Ron still doesn't notice. Ron is so oblivious. He makes Harry look observant. It's true. The only reason he knew Lav Lav was into him is because she kissed him right on the mouth. Yeah. It's true. She All grabbed about being direct. And just... Ugh. It's like my <laughs> dog when we first get home. I must love you. <laughs> yes. He is. Yeah. Lavender is definitely like a dog trying to make out with you. It's gross. Make out with Ron, I suppose I should say. <laughs> but... This puts Hermione in a really good mood all day, even to the point that she actually tells Harry she'll check over his herbology paper. And she's been saying she won't do that because she knew if she helped Harry, he would then help Ron. And she didn't want to help Ron even indirectly. Same. So now that they're friends again, she's willing to look over Harry's paper. So he like finishes it and he gives it to her and he's just like, thanks, Hermione. I got to get to my meeting with Dumbledore. He's got to go to Dumbledore's at eight. Dumbledore's at eight. So he rushes off to get there, makes it right at eight, knocks on the door and is told to come in. And he walks through the door, surprised to find that Professor Trelawney, (laughs) the racist, racist Professor Trelawney, Oh dear. Is also in Dumbledore's office. And I don't know, because you weren't part of that episode. I, I can, But yeah. you remember that, right? When they're at Slughorn's party. Yeah. And she's literally calling for Ren's... The horse? Or the the horse, mule or something? She's bad. It's bad. <laughs> it's not very nice. And in this one, she calls him a usurping nag. <laughs> <laughs> she's really just like, get this bitch out of here. Right. My job, my job, my job, my job. Right? Can I be truthful, though? Like, I get it. Like, Dumbledore kind of hired a person under her, because technically she's been there longer. She would have seniority. But she has to, like, hide in her tower because he's like, oh, I'm not going to let you work here, but you can live here. That's fine. I I mean, she's still teaching. She is now. But, like, when he initially hired friends, she just had to stay in her tower. Because she was allowed to live, but not teach. But that wasn't Dumbledore's fault. That was Umbridge's fault. But he still hired somebody. <laughs> That's well, what I'm saying. And didn't he boot them to out. He hire yeah, someone. Yeah, I know. I was, I, I'm following Carly. So yeah. that Umbridge didn't. Yeah. Yeah. But once Umbridge was gone and Headmaster was restored, you know, he let friends stay. I hear Trelawney's argument as insecurity, since we've been talking about insecurity yeah. this episode. And... I don't think Dumbledore does a really good job at helping her feel secure in her position because he doesn't think divination is worth his time, (laughs) which is weird because I'm pretty sure he's a seer, but whatever. I think that in this, yeah, definitely it's an insecurity thing and the inability to understand what the situation is too and i don't know how much of the situation she even knows because dumbledore is not always great about being forthcoming about stuff like that he said that she doesn't know he literally no i mean about forens not being able to go back to the forest like forens literally has nowhere else to go well yeah dumbledore could really just say that and i feel like she would probably feel better right honestly and you know what he maybe has we don't know that. We don't know what she And it could just be knows. her anxiety yelling. Yeah. And and maybe he said that and she just hasn't heard it, you know? Yeah, you know, maybe it's that. Because it happens. she's racist. <laughs> well, there's also that. Yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> she's heard it. She just can't believe you're letting that low porn creature teach with her. <laughs> that is weird that she is just so, like, blatantly racist. And, like, nobody ever says anything about Trelawney being blatantly well, racist against friends i don't know that it is specifically her having anything against centaurs yeah she does try to talk to him about divination stuff and he kind of dismisses he's a little her racist and, towards humans well so. oh, I mean, centaurs are he's yes. like man so i feel like she, i feel like they had an encounter that put a bad taste in her mouth i get it but dumbledore is trying to damage control on this mm-hmm. and is like 
But he's also tired. <laughs> yes, very much so. This is not the first meeting they've had. And Trelawney's just like, oh, so this is the reason you're unceremoniously throwing me from your office. And Yes, the boy who lived is more important than you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, and Dumbledore's just like, you're not being unceremoniously thrown from anywhere. But Harry does have an appointment. And we've pretty much said all that there is to be said. So, bye. Usurping I, nag. Yeah, but you she, are the usurping nag. She insists that she should go find a job at a different school that actually appreciates her talents and then leaves and like stumbles down the stairs, leaves, tripping over her shawls or something. I just, yeah, in true Trelawney fashion. Yeah. She's just a bumbling, clumsy person. I love, I love, I love the whole concept of the woman with the inner eye being so oblivious to her surroundings. Being so drunk, she can't put that it too. together. That too. Poor woman did really develop a drinking problem from this point on. And cooking sherry, of all things. <laughs> it's what's I mean, there. It's, <laughs> honestly, if I had the gift of sight, I would probably need a lot of alcohol too. My husband and I just watched Daredevil for the first time, thinking about this. He has to sleep in a sensory deprivation tank. I feel like that's Trelawney. She's like, there's too much happening in my brain. I need to shut it off. So she drinks to deal with that. That seems possible. Mm-hmm. Because she does have it. I don't know how often she has it, but she does have it. She doesn't seem to be aware of the really legitimate ones she has, though. Yeah, her other ones, like, are just good guesses. <laughs> They're like... <laughs> airy fairy mysterious guesses like neville breaking a cup how long have you known neville right Man. that was a pretty good prediction <laughs> yeah. based on Past previous dealings. knowledge yeah. like someone is probably gonna break a mug it happens every year this klutzy kid looks the most likely i remember nervous. hearing stories in the staff lounge about him trying to find a broomstick oh sweet boy this is the one. I'm gonna the one. I'm, I'm gonna call gonna... it and I'm gonna make him nervous and it's gonna come true and the rest of the class is gonna be super impressed. Yeah, that's yeah. what she does. Also, Harry's gonna die if we didn't know that. So Well I just love the fact that Harry briefly starts talking to Dumbledore about her being upset that Ferenz is still teaching there and Dumbledore's just like Please no. Yes. <laughs> Alas, having never studied the subject myself, I could not have foreseen how disastrously this would have gone trying to split the post. Yikes. And it's just so funny because, like you said, I too... He is a seer. ...think that he has seeing ability. Every little piece of Harry's life, from the point that he was dropped off at the Dursleys to the point that he dies, was planned out by Dumbledore. And I think that the third... Fantastic Beast movie even showed. Yes, it did. More so how he had that sight. He just understands better than anybody, probably because he has that sight. He understands how fickle it can be. Yeah, With he great doesn't power. believe in divination because why would I read tea leaves when I can see shit that's actually going to happen? Yeah. I mean, that is the divination part, but like he knows that it doesn't matter if you see something that is going to happen there's so many factors that could change it that's dr strange yeah so it's like yes. yeah i can do this but i also know that this is not a guarantee unless i do everything unless to make i'm sure it is right <laughs> right yeah i know and that's i think that's why he doesn't see value in the class because a lot of the class is just teaching you how to try to read tea leaves whether yeah, you have the gift or not <laughs> he literally even says to Harry that he has to keep her there because she has no idea she made those predictions and how much danger that would put her in if anybody found out it was her. Right. And she's safe at Hogwarts. So he has to keep her there to keep her protected and let her teach her subject to the best of her ability, which is not... She yeah, has to have some amazing. Other subject, honestly. Yeah. She wouldn't want some other subject though. This is her identity. It really is, but 
depraved. Like Dumbledore wouldn't let them escort her off campus after she was fired because he knew it was dangerous for her yeah. to be yeah. off campus. He didn't hire her because she was an exceptionally good teacher. He hired her <laughs> because he wanted to be able to protect her. Yeah, and there's more of that gets mentioned later later yeah. on. So we can talk more about that at that yeah. point too. But I think what I also love here is that Dumbledore is just like, but never mind my staffing issues. <laughs> never mind adult stuff. Yeah, let's move on to more important things. And naturally launches right into, did you get the real memory from Slughorn? And Harry's like, oh shit. And you know, excuse, 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 excuse. Ron was poisoned. He was in the hospital. I cracked my skull open. I'm super busy with apparition lessons and school stuff. I can't stop sticking my nose up Nazi von douchebag's ass. Like, all of the excuses as to why he was not able to get it and him just being like, well, I asked him after class once and he wouldn't give it to me. And then you got Dumbledore's response, which is just so... So very Dumbledore. Do you feel you exerted your very best efforts in the matter? That you exercised all of your considerable ingenuity and that you have no depth of cunning left to retrieve this memory? I hate this. Honestly, Dumbledore, you already know the answer. So, like, just give Harry a break. Right? Yeah, why wouldn't you just start with, Hey, I know you've had a rough last few days. But still seems like you didn't try very hard at this. Yeah. Right. A or little just bit more direct. Be like, bitch, get it next time, I guess, because we got to have it. We need this. <laughs> Give we him need a this. deadline, man. Yeah. But Potter, honestly, I need this by Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> but as Harry said, he would have rather Dumbledore yelled at him than, than the showed him this disappointment, this very calm disappointment. Granted, this Harry has never been yelled, did you put your name in the goblet of fire? And maybe if he had experienced that, he would have felt differently. <laughs> but in this moment, he was just like, God damn, I wish he was just yelling at me instead of looking at me like I killed his puppy. Yeah. And it makes him feel so bad that he let him down. This was what really made him realize he had to push for it. And I think Dumbledore knows that about him. I think Dumbledore understood that, like, it's not going to do me any good to yell at him. Like, he needs to get how important this is to prioritize it. Because it's the same thing. Like, he had zero ability to prioritize trying to learn how to do occlumency. Yeah. And he was perfectly capable of it. He finally figures it out in the seventh book. <laughs> But like takes him a while. Right. He's capable of it, but if he does not have that drive present, he ain't gonna do it. And Dumbledore is like, the only thing I can do to get this drive present is to really impart upon him how important it is. And that was making him feel super ashamed that he did not really try. Because he did not really try. I hate this though. Cause Dumbledore in this moment makes me feel like every teacher who Never thought that I tried hard enough. And it's hard to read for me. I mean, I think that speaks to how Harry must have been feeling in that yeah, moment. Yeah, definitely. And it's supposed to be a callback. So yeah. that you know the feeling. And you know just how Harry's like, oh, no, I got to do this. I okay. really screwed up. Yeah. And he does. Like, he does feel ashamed and... He does try to defend himself a little bit, but at the same time, he ultimately ends up saying, I'm sorry, I should have done more. Yep. I should have realized that you would not have asked me to do this if it wasn't important. And then Dumbledore's just like, thank you for saying that. But for now. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> I trust that you're going to put real effort into this on your next attempt. And Harry's just like, okay, good, thank God. Yeah, let's do this. And there could have also been from Harry. He could have been like, I'm working on it. Right. <laughs> Instead of being like, no. <laughs> yeah, but, but I like better that he was honest. Yeah, yeah. He is a Gryffindor. So Dumbledore is like, okay, I believe you. This seems sincere. We can move on. 
we're going to kind of go over what we talked about before, pick up where we left off. And he asks if Harry remembers what they had previously talked about. So Harry just gives a brief summary about how they saw that Voldemort killed his grandparents and dad and then framed his uncle for it. And then he like kind of stutters because the shame comes back when he has to mention where he was told to get the real memory from Slughorn and he didn't do it. But Dumbledore's just like, yeah, okay, you remember, we're good. Let's just move forward. And says that now they're really entering that realm of guesswork and speculation, which they've always kind of been in, but he's running out of memories at this point. And he's really just taking what he has and weaving the story together as much as he can and without the memory from Slughorn. Mm -hmm. He thinks he knows what is actually in that memory from Slughorn, but until he sees it and knows to confirm sure. it, he's just guessing. And that's kind of where they're sitting. This little recap just reminds me of when you're in D&D &D and your DM's like, so what happened last week? And you're like, uh... <laughs> So Dumbledore's Dungeon Master. Dumbledore Dungeon Master. The DDM. The DDM. And like I was saying, it all has basically been guesswork, but he's made these deductions from memories and therefore sort of an evidence. And he's just like, do you agree so far that what I have deduced makes sense for what De Voldemort has been up to until the age of 17? And Harry's just like, yeah, it makes sense to me. So Dumbledore's was like, okay, we're going to move on and it's going to get weirder <laughs> because it was almost impossible to find anybody that was willing to speak or reminisce about adult Voldemort. That's partially because the people that he was close to, and I use close very loosely it's because like his inner circle, right? Those people, none of them are going to talk to Dumbledore. And then anybody that had encounters with him outside of that, probably they weren't good encounters. And they didn't survive. Or, yeah, so either they didn't survive or they're just too scared to talk about it. But, yeah, so like I said, nobody is there to talk about adult Voldemort. So the very little bit that he could get, he really had to kind of finagle. And it wasn't necessarily super useful to speak to Voldemort as a person, but it certainly helped illuminate a potential path he went down, which because it's Dumbledore, he ends up being right. <laughs> Convenient like that for the sake of a story, I suppose. Hmm. But he mentions that there's two more memories that he wants to share. And for me, like we said at the start of this compare and contrast section, to leave this out... Yeah. And to leave the other one out when he gets, like, he gets two horcruxes, yeah. two bases for his horcruxes in this memory. And yeah, he gets and another one in the previous memory that they left out with his uncle. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when you get to the point that they're talking about the horcruxes and Harry's trying to destroy them or Dumbledore's destroying the ones that he can or they're fetching them, where the fuck did these come from? I don't even think they do a very good job of explaining that. what a horcrux is. Well, yes, but also that Voldemort was after powerful magical objects, connections old to Hogwarts, Pinex old connection, <laughs> old connections to Hogwarts and things like that. Like the cup, like you see it in the movie and you're like, the fuck, What's that? what is this fucking gold ass cup? You have no Again, idea that as a person who didn't read the books first, I was like, it's a chalice. So what? Okay. Why? What's special about that chalice? Oh, okay. okay. Now, granted, we don't learn about it in this half of the chapter, so we'll talk about that in the next episode. But still. But still, like, to learn about yeah. the what Voldemort did after leaving Hogwarts. And we don't even get him leaving Hogwarts we in don't the movie get at any all. Of this. None. There's not even anything. Like you said, after 16, it's just like, gone. So, like I said, there's two more memories. We're going to start getting into the first one for the back part of this episode. And 
Dumbledore says before we can get into the memory, I do need to kind of go over what I know Voldemort did leaving Hogwarts. And that involves not going to the Ministry of Magic like Professor Slughorn and several other teachers were recommending he do because he was just so talented. He had top marks and everything. He was the prefect, head boy, won that award for special services to the school, even though he also caused the need for that. But that's a, that was a few books ago. So, but he, by all, <coughs> but he, for all intents and purposes, looked very impressive. And they thought he was going to do great things. And he's just like, nah, I'm going to go work at, Bro nah, I'm going to go work at Borgen and Burks. And Harry's just like, why would he go work at Borgen and Burks? And Dumbledore figures it'll make sense once they go over that. He's like, I think you're going to see what appealed to him about that place. But that will yeah. become clear in this first memory we go into because it's the memory of this little house elf named Hokey. Just wee Hokey girl. Who serves a very old and very wealthy witch. I think this information stunning Harry is very good world building. Because even Harry kind of realizes that the valedictorian going to work in retail <laughs> after they finish school is like, oh, that, what? That wasn't like a red flag to anybody being like, that's weird. Well, at first I was like, why would you see Morgan and Burks that way? Because to me, it's like working in antiquity. And then well, I was there's like, that. well, but old it's... magic shit's just normal to those people. So it is like it working is more yeah. at, the, at the gap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it is funny that he's just like, shock. Why would he do that? That seems completely Shook. beneath him. Yep. And then Dumbledore says, well, that wasn't his first choice for jobs. So I do feel like there could have been an element of taking a job just to pass a little bit of time till he was old enough till to take ready, on yeah. the job he wanted because Dumbledore explains that Riddle actually went to Professor Dippet, who was headmaster at the time, and requested to stay there. It was just like, Professor Mary thought's retiring. You're going to need a defense against the dark arts teacher. I was really good at this shit. Like, can I stay and be a teacher? And ultimately, Armando Dippet said he was too young, but was like, if you still want to do this in a few years, apply again. So I could see him being like, I'm just going to take a job, whatever, that's not a career and just buy some time until I he can was, go back and teach. Yeah, he was still s very specific, though. Yes. About what he Oh, took. no, for sure. And even being a teacher at Hogwarts was yeah. meant to be very specific. So I think that everything was very calculated. Actually, I'm sure for, that yeah. everything was very calculated. And it does kind of surprise Harry that he wanted to stay at Hogwarts as well. And he asked Dumbledore about that. And Dumbledore says, well, he didn't tell Professor Dippet why he wanted to stay. But my theory is that it was because, A, it was the only place that ever felt like home and he was happiest there. And Harry's just like, that's not me at all. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this. And then Dumbledore also says that there were bound to be more mysteries to unravel at Hogwarts more access to powerful objects that he was looking for and naturally a good recruiting round because he actually made quite a few followers just being a student there could you imagine what he could do as a teacher and i think dumbledore even said he probably got the idea from slughorn himself who was literally collecting students and creating that network mm -hmm. but like I said, he does invite him to come back in a few years if he still wants to teach. So I do think it's possible that he's just like, okay, well, I'm going to approach my goals from a different angle mm -hmm. and then I'll get in where I want. And I think that 
what ends up happening, what he ends up gaining access to, set his returning to school plan back a little bit further mm-hmm. because he gained more from that job that yep. he probably originally anticipated. Yeah. But we'll talk more about that next time. So they get back t- on track to the conversation of Voldemort working with Borgen and Burks and how everybody on staff thought that was such a waste for such a brilliant young wizard. But Dumbledore specifically states that he wasn't just a mere retail assistant. Yeah. He was polite and handsome and very clever, and that made him really, really good at persuading people to part with their treasures. And Harry's just like, yeah, I'll bet he was. <laughs> and then Dumbledore's just like, yes, yeah, quite. And I just, like, I wanted exchanges like that. Where were those in the movie? We also don't get Harry and Dumbledore's relationship at all. No. We don't get the build. We don't get the love that has grown between them from 11 to 17. No, he's no. still just, like, throughout the entire movie series he's this stern father figure yes which harry needed but <laughs> but it wasn't it's dumbledore the Har- in the it's books. the father he needed not the father he deserved exactly <laughs> that was shitty <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like i said dumbledore's just like quite and then says okay so first memory from hokey the house elf working for Hepzibah Smith, super wealthy lady. And he uses magic to uncork the bottle because his hand's still fucked up and he can't do it with his hand. Pours it into the pensive and just like, after you. (laughs) So Harry stands, sticks his nose into the pensive, tumbles through the darkness, and lands in a sitting room in front of a very fat old lady, as she is described. Why? I don't know. Why? I don't know. As a chonky person, why? I don't know. She puts so much emphasis on that. You just really don't have to say that she's fat. You could say she is an old lady. Bada bing. I love the description of the... She could still look like a melting cake. Elaborate ginger wig and Mm -hmm. the brilliant pink robes flowing around her that makes her look like a melting cake. You don't have to be fat for that. No. No. I've seen Why is cakes. that something that and now granted admittedly she was writing this back during the your mama so fat jokes time like unfortunately there was way too much emphasis on fat being funny back in then. all of the books in every single one from yeah the Dursleys but that was the 90s to well that yeah. was the fucking 90s it sucked I'm so glad that I was not yeah, it was literally emotionally present. <laughs> I never ever liked those your mama so fat jokes. I never thought they were funny. I never like as a chubby mom, I am stressed out. It's so <laughs> pointless and stupid and and mean for like no, no reason. reason. But it was pathetically the norm in the 90s. Yeah. Other people bodies just aren't your business and aren't shouldn't I shouldn't say aren't shouldn't be the subject of your comedy. Yes. No. Correct. I agree. But it bothers me always. And to make her this kind of foolish woman who falls for Voldemort's handsome skullduggery, like the Dursleys are fat and they're mean. Aunt Marge is fat and she's mean. All the people she makes fat or chubby, except with the exception of Neville, but he's an idiot in most of the books. Like... There doesn't she have to literally be... use it as a tool to make somebody less likable in some way. Yes, and mm-hmm. I don't like that. No. As no, I mean, a but... chubby kid that read these books, I didn't feel like it was okay. <laughs> and, and it's I not okay. Don't. Yeah, no, it's not okay. It's not okay. And I think before she had the trans community to really like hone her eye in on, I it was think fat people. It was probably heavy people. That wouldn't wow. surprise me. It's in just that way, social work. media wasn't what it is today. It's true. Then. She couldn't yeah. make an idiot out of herself over fat people back then. Yeah. Anyways, it bothers me that every time there's somebody with some sort of... Dislikable quality, dislikable they're also fat. Dislikable quality, they are also fat. Yeah. Like Slughorn. Yeah. Yep. No, it's, it's a consistent theme. Across the board, yes. Mm-hmm. And I really am grateful that we've reached a time where we can have this conversation. It is a nice breath of fresh air but it doesn't 
it doesn't go back and fix what this, it was yeah you no. know like this lives on doesn't take back to 16 year old carly being no. sad that she's reading about fat and people the being complexes terrible. that that can cause for you i'm okay i suppose <laughs> <laughs> well not you just yeah, you just personally you in general collectively. Yeah. i imagine there were a lot of people who felt like that reading yeah. them mm-hmm. but i think that if we can acknowledge that as len and i like to say simpler times and use it as a stepping stone to be better going forward and treat people better going forward that it's not in vain at least but you know who is perfect little miss hokey hokey yes, little tiny hokey the adorable tiniest little elf you just wanted to pick her up and just so sweet. seriously though if i had a house elf that like i got through family I just, they'd be a baby. I just wrap them up and they'd be like, I love you. You don't do anything. I just take care of you. I was born a house elf. I identify as a house elf. (laughs) But according to my master, I just a baby. just a baby. (laughs) It's true. It's true. But anyway, this adorable little house elf is helping Miss Hepzibah Smith get into her shoes as she's touching up her makeup and trying to look as pretty as she can for the arrival of this charming and handsome young man and i do see how a lonely old woman could get completely taken by yes this situation it is the same reason why so many fucking scammers target old Old people people, yeah it's very realistic i don't like though continuing on the ugly fat thing harry's like he'd never seen anybody look less attractive she, she looked old. a long way from lovely is what he thinks and yes it she is has mean. old she lived a hard life i'm sure probably well maybe not that hard but but a, a full one, one. <laughs> yeah but a full one yeah. she lived and she has children and grandchildren leave her alone you I mean, stupid 16 year old boy it is a very 16 year old boy thought though. it is well, and hokey may not have been lying no hokey was probably like you Maybe look she beautiful really does think she looks lovely yes because she's a nice master. she's a sweet little elf and she is a sweet little elf anyway doorbell rings hepzibah's like he's here and hokey mm-hmm. goes scurrying through what is described as a very cluttered room like it so crammed with objects that it kind of looks like a mixture of a magical antique shop and a conservatory because there's a bunch of plants too so i feel like it probably kind of gives some room of requirement vibes to a certain extent too just shit piled everywhere and then when she comes back when the little elf comes back she's leading a tall young man who harry immediately recognizes as voldemort He's dressed very simply in an all black suit. His hair is a little bit longer than it was from the last memory Harry saw of him. His cheeks look a little bit hollower, but apparently all of this suits him and he looks more handsome than ever. Weird for Harry to notice that. I mean, maybe it was a jealousy thing. Maybe. Like, why don't I look that good? It's true. You're just awkward and... 16 yeah why do all the evil guys get all the good looks <laughs> it's true though if he looked like he did in the second one Oof. i would have joined the death right? eaters goodbye I'm he was handsome he was handsome <laughs> but if a handsome man comes in and he kisses your hand and you're an old lady who's probably a widow and hasn't had very much affection in a while <laughs> it's nice and he gives her flowers, which is nice. I love the fact that she's just like, oh, you naughty boy, you shouldn't have, but has, has a vase ready, ready for him. I'm yeah. more impressed by the fact that Harry notices that. Yes. <laughs> I feel like in these situations, he is... Attempting to be. Meddling. Oh, well, he is true. meddling with every aspect of this memory that he can. It's true. When he's meddling, Harry, he notices things. He sees and understands a lot. <laughs> It's true. But anyway, Hepzibah Smith invites Tom to sit down, asks where Hokey is, and Hokey comes back in carrying a plate of cakes, <laughs> and she's just got it over her head, weaving through all of this stuff that makes it look like the plate's just, like, floating, floating towards them. It's cute. And Hepzibah offers Tom 
some cakes because she knows how much he loves her cakes and comments on how he looks pale and they overwork him at the shop and he just like smiles they describe it as being mechanical and this just makes her simper anyway like oh i got a smile out of him he's so charming he's so handsome and then she asks him what his excuse to visit this time is and voldemort immediately jumps into business he's like well mr burke sent me back with an improved offer of 500 galleons for the goblin made armor and she's just like oh no, 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 not so fast or i'm gonna think you're only here for my trinkets ma'am i'm and, sorry to tell you right it's only there for your trinkets and voldemort's like well i'm ordered here because of them and he's just a poor assistant who must do as he's told Blah. so he starts to talk again about what mr burke wishes and she's just like oh fooey to mr burke i have something to show you that i've never shown mr burke and if you can keep a secret because i don't want him to know i have this or he'd be all over it and i will not sell this but i think you're gonna appreciate it so i want to show it to you and voldemort just says i would be glad to see anything miss hepsiba has to show me and she giggles tee hee hee and sends Hokey to bring their finest treasure, which is where we're cutting. And naturally, as there are no movie scenes, <laughs> there are no actors. Since we don't have any actors and we don't have any new things to talk about, that'll bring us to the Potter Pondering, which is about them leaving stuff out of the movie. <laughs> So what are your thoughts on the movie leaving out Tom Riddle's job at Borgen and Burks? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. Don't forget, you can also stitch your response on TikTok. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. This week's wizarding word is that Homesick, a home fragrance brand, has a Harry Potter collection. There are several different candles, platform nine and three quarters, Quidditch pitch, Hogwarts, one for each house, and a Diagon Alley candle, plus a sorting hat air freshener. I feel like the Quidditch pitch one is just going to smell sweaty. Yeah, oh, like no, a guy's grass. locker. It's going to smell like ass. It's going to be like grass and wind and sweat. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of leather for the quaffle. Yeah, it's it's just going to smell like a dirty boy's locker room. That's what it's going to smell like. Maybe a little urine might be in there. I wouldn't pay the $50 that they charge for the candle. Not for Quidditch pitch. Mm -hmm. No. And I feel like the sorting hat air freshener is just going to smell like a lot of different people's oily scalps. You <laughs> 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 take your hair oil and put it in this air freshener. <laughs> Uh, or but, maybe that one could smell like leather. I, I mean, think it, the Quidditch pitch is going to smell like what Harry smells when he... The woody handle of a broomstick. Yeah, when he yeah. smells the Amortentia. I think they actually put on the candles like what they're supposed to smell like. Yes, they yeah. do. Yeah. I have the article link for it. We'll share it on our Facebook page so you can look for them yourself. We just thought that was pretty cool. But that will bring us to this week's trivia question. And that is, how much time passed between Hepzibah Smith's meeting with Voldemort and her death? The first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word hashtag not sugar will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us, either through Apple or whatever podcast platform you listen on or on our Facebook page. Make sure to email us at foxsakepod at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Pod. Following us on Podbean at Pod will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at ForFoxSakePodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where, in addition to our weekly podcast episodes, we post some other random videos like blooper reels, vlogs, our old cooking show episodes, hopefully new ones if we manage to make some. We do have a patron program. You can find us on Patreon at Fox Sake Pod. 
Patronage starts at $2 and will get you some awesome perks like for Fox sake swag, access to our Discord channel, chats, and more. Check out our page for the details. With that being said, this is going to be my Carly's last episode for a little while. But as my favorite friend Mickey Mouse says, we don't say goodbye around here. We say see you real soon, pal. So I will be back. But with baby and we are moving states there's lots of things happening so i will be back virtually but that doesn't seem to be a problem for abigail so hopefully it won't be a problem for me either yeah we've been doing kind of like a rotating host thing at this point that i've got abigail and max to host with me when they can if that means i get both of them i get both of them if something comes up and one of them can't make it then I still have the other. And when Carly's back settled in the new state. <laughs> Which Ellen is sad about. I just stuck my lower lip out, but yeah. I get it. I'm going to miss you in person. Mm-hmm. But I know that she'll be able to get her own remote stuff set up and we'll just have a fun Zoom meeting or we'll figure out how to do it through Discord so that our patrons and anybody who wants to become a patron can join in and mm-hmm. join the shenanigans. So it's a little bit of a transitional time. You're probably going to start to notice some changes. We're going to try and update our Patreon stuff a little bit more. But now that I have somewhere between three and four of us doing this, I'm hoping that we can balance things out a little bit better. And join us next time when we talk about the second half of Chapter 20, Lord Voldemort's Request, and the second half of the missing film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Carly. I'm Abigail. I'm Ellen. And we are... For For Fox Fox Sake. Sake.